seated. All right, how many of you knew that Alex was such a good singer? Huh? There's, uh, you know, small churches. It's very helpful when people are slashes. You know what I mean when I say that? I was a football player. They called him Slash because he did a bunch of things. We have some slashes that play multiple instruments and do lots of stuff. There's a lot of people that do a lot of things here. Um, it's okay if you're not a Slash. We, we still want to use your gifts. And if you are a member of this church and have been hiding your musical skills under a bushel, let us know. (laughs) Kath reminded me that it was a year ago, not to the day, but to the Sunday that we candidated here. So that's uh, that's pretty cool. It was the Sunday before Thanksgiving. And uh, I don't know if you remember, the text was from Luke. The ten lepers, one thankful, nine that didn't return. So we're back in Luke, but we're going to start from the beginning. Maybe I'll skip that text when we get to it. I don't know, maybe I'll just re-preach it or have Phil preach it better. Yeah. So turn with me to the beginning of the Gospel of Luke. Short enough to memorize but I'm not that committed, sorry. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who were from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. That's the entirety of our text this morning, but 2 Timothy 3, chapter 16 and 17 reminds us that all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Let's pray. Almighty, eternal, merciful God, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Open and illuminate our hearts and minds to better understand your word and to conform our lives to what we've understood. In the name of Jesus, amen. I like to read a lot. can frustrate my family curled up in the corner with a book, but they do too, so that's good. Someone asked me recently, what podcast do you listen to? I was like, I I, I never caught the podcast wave, and they were like, oh, that's because you read. All right, I I do enjoy reading, uh, and I I really enjoy buying books even more and having them sit very nicely and organized in my library, as Nicole will poke fun at, but uh, You may think that being a pastor, I love to read really deep, systematic theology, and you would be half right. Uh, Sometimes when I need to get to sleep at night, man, I pull out the uh, Puritan John Owen or the Dutch theologian Herman Ritterboss, you know, the stuff that Phil understands and I like struggle with. So I'm just going to use you today, sorry, a bunch. Um, I see the value in reading deep theology, so, you know, I, I try, I, I mix it in a little bit, but I really, want, especially when I'm home, I, I want to enjoy what I read, and sometimes it's a real escape, and so I like fiction, you know, and I kind of favor the adventure over mysteries or something like that, um, but if I'm going for nonfiction, at the top of my list is biographies and autobiographies. Um, I'm not sure why I'm so drawn to the story of people's lives, um, especially ones written by, uh, you know, about people who have already died. They've already happened, all right? Um, and, and really, the autobiographies are written by people who really love themselves, so they're not going to be completely honest and accurate either. Uh, but I find myself wanting to read uh, 
Alex Trebek's autobiography or Matthew McConaughey or Michael J. Fox, whoever's released one recently. Um, I, part of this uh, maybe stems from one of the most life-changing books I ever read was the biography of Keith Green. Do you know who that is? A Christian musician from the 70s and 80s uh, who died in about 1982. Uh, but he was a real prophetic voice. And he was really the first person outside of the pages of Scripture or uh, you know, people that I knew personally, but he was like just this guy who took his faith so seriously. And as a 16, 17-year-old, whenever I read it, it just was the perfect book to help you kind of unite my faith. Uh, I, I was a Christian, but, you know, it helped me take it to the, to be, get real serious about it in high school. Um, and so biographies, books have the, the opportunity to do that. Um, uh, not everything I read is this life-changing. Uh, I've recently read a, a biography of Martin Luther, but then I mixed in, I, I read uh, Stephen Curse Chapman's autobiography, uh, Nick Foles, uh, go, go Eagles. Come on, I'm trying to fit in here with my Steeler mask. Um, uh, Val Kilmer, that is. Uh, Bruce Dickinson, the lead singer of Iron Maiden. Uh, anyways, uh, I do own a stack of, like, presidents and really important American historical figures, but, but those, you know, I, I'd rather read somebody recently. And I'm trying to figure out why that is. Uh, there's some strange fascination with uh, successful, famous people that I think maybe that I'll figure out something about how they've lived that got them where they are. Um, maybe I just want to know that they have really ordinary lives too, and that they're flawed. You know, I don't know if you know this, Nick Foles almost quit football after the first like five years before he came back to Philadelphia and was the Super Bowl MVP. Stephen Curtis Chapman uh, really struggled with his faith and with his marriage after his daughter was accidentally killed. And all of these celebrities and actors just, you know, they wrestle with insecurity and addiction and broken marriages. I guess it gives me hope that I, I can live a solid life despite my own flaws and bad decisions and insecurities. But I'm leading up to today. Today we get to delve into one of the four greatest biographies ever written, all written about the same person. The subject is a person, a man who didn't write anything about himself because he knew that others would write it about him and was very careful to pass on what he wanted recorded, I'm sure. Um, unlike the other books of the, the men and women that I've been reading, this man had no flaws, no misdeeds, although he lived a life of grief and sorrow. But, you know, far from alienating the reader from him, I think his life, his actions, his obvious love for those around him drew people to him and continue to draw the reader in. Several of his biographers knew him very well. They lived life with him. Uh, so they could tell stories that they had been witnesses to, that they had experienced, that even about themselves. This biographer, the one that we're going to study, was not one of them. Uh, as far as we, don't, we know, that he never met his subject. But he set out to carefully interview people who had been there, to get all of his facts straight, put all of his considerable talent behind producing the most reliable and true account possible. Thank God for a man named Luke who dedicated himself to writing the best biography that he could about a man named Jesus. Now, we're only dealing, as I said, with the first four verses in a book that has 1,151 verses. So we're going to take him four verses at a time and finish by the time the kids that I just baptized get to college. No, we'll, we'll take much bigger chunks as we go. Don't worry. Uh, and I think we'll break it up with sermon series along the way, maybe next summer. Although if 2020 has taught us anything, hold your plans loosely, right? Write them in a pencil. Be ready to flex. Uh, 
But these four, first four verses, are, I think, are going to get us a good introduction, background. Let's look at the first two and a half verses to understand the writer and his context better. Let me read that again. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account. Quiz time. Which author was the biggest contributor to the New Testament? Paul, right? He, he wrote 13 books. Nope. John? John wrote a gospel, three letters, and revelation. Nope. Luke. All right, Luke, who wrote two books, his gospel and the book of Acts, account for 27% of the New Testament. Now, we don't know who wrote Hebrews. That may bat, tip the scales. Maybe Paul, maybe Luke, maybe somebody else, Barnabas. We don't know. Um, but what we do know is that, yeah, 27% of the New Testament are just Luke's two historical accounts. Now, we might have still had a, a wonderful, we, we would still have a great picture of Jesus with three Gospels, even with one Gospel, right? But in the sovereignty of God, God's providence, He gave us four, each unique in some ways. Uh, and can you imagine if we didn't have the book of Acts? How little we would know about the early church, at least from an insider's perspective. Again, so grateful for Luke. Uh, listen, if you want to turn real quickly, the beginning of Acts chapter 1, the beginning of Acts, the book. Luke prefaces that book. In the first book, O Theophilus, so we know they're connected, even though Luke doesn't name himself, the church history said Luke wrote both of these, and that, that really hasn't been challenged well. Uh, so we can be fully confident he was the author of both. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. And then he launches into the story of the apostles and the early church. And it's often called the Acts of the Apostle. But, you know, it's interesting, if you look at that first verse again, all that Jesus began to do and teach. So sometimes you could say it's the continuing acts of Jesus through his apostles, or the Spirit's acts through the apostles. But the point is that Luke and Acts form this continuing narrative. And I, I sometimes wonder why they didn't move John, right? Wouldn't that make a little more sense for Luke just to flow right into Acts? But there's some good reasons for that. Right, uh, John is very different. He was written much later than the other gospel accounts. Uh, you probably know the term synoptic to refer to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. What does synoptic mean? Sin, sign, meaning same or together. Optic, to see. So they see things the same way, together. So much is similar. They often record the same stories parables, sometimes use the same wording. I don't know if you've ever looked at a harmony of the Gospels that lines up, and it's fascinating to see where they have the same accounts and wording and where they diverge. We'll come back to those differences and see how Luke is distinctive from the other synoptics. John is very different, man. John is filling in, I think, what he's, he's got the other gospel accounts. He says, all right, I got some other great stories. Let me fill you in. Now, Luke acknowledges in verse 1 that many other people had written a narrative of Jesus' life. So I, I don't think we're confined to just the three other gospel writers. And I'm not even sure if he knew John was working on it or uh, we're, we're, we're dating this around 60 and John's probably in the... 70s, 80s. Um, so, but it's, it's most likely he's referring to a lot of other people that have worked on some kind of account of Jesus' life, and he's probably read them. Uh, in, again, in the providence 
of God, only four made it into the final canon of Scripture, right? Because they were absolutely accurate, trustworthy, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and apostolically um, authorized. Now, Luke was not, as I said earlier, he was not an eyewitness to Jesus' ministry like John was, like Matthew was, like Peter, who was most likely Mark's source, right? So he, he interviewed the eyewitnesses, the ones who had been there. Now, you probably know Luke ends up being a companion and a fellow traveler with Paul. And as you read the book of Acts, it's really interesting. You get to the 20th chapter, and he switches his pronouns from they to we. Right? And it's kind of jarring. It's like, wait, what just happened? Because Luke is now part of the team. He doesn't even mention himself, necessarily. But for Jesus' life, Luke was an investigative journalist and historian who carefully researched and interviewed people to find the facts. I'm convinced that he interviewed Jesus' mother, Mary. I don't, we don't know that for sure, of course. We don't know anybody that he interviewed necessarily because he didn't footnote it, he didn't mention it. But we have so much information about her inner thoughts and, and things, conversations, only things she would know. That's sanctified imagination is what we call that, in case it's not true. But uh, one historian said this about Luke's skill in interviewing and getting the details right. Wherever modern scholarship has been able to check up on the accuracy of Luke's work, the judgment has been unanimous. He is one of the finest and ablest historians in the ancient world. So there's no reason to doubt Luke's scholarship and accuracy just because he believes what he wrote about. Uh, Sometimes there's a bias where, oh, Josephus, he was an unbiased historian because he wasn't one of the believers, one of the new followers of Jesus. Well, we're going to apply the same standards. Luke's scholarship was excellent. This is not his philosophy or his theology or theories. These are events that happen in specific times and places. Of course, he had to figure out how to present them, and he arranges them theologically to teach, but that doesn't take away from the historical accuracy. So, uh, one, the other thing we need to acknowledge, and this is where Josephus does not have the advantage that Luke has, is that Luke had a co-writer. Doesn't mention it. People don't talk about it. uh, Except those who understand how scriptures are put together. God guided Luke's writings. Right? I already quoted 2 Timothy 3.16 right after reading the passage. All scripture is breathed out by God. Listen to 1 Peter chapter 1, 20 and 21, hopefully a familiar passage about how the Scriptures came about. Peter says, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. They guided the prophets and the Scripture writers. So Luke had this co-writer, so to speak, that helped him. The Holy Spirit guided him so that he got everything correct. Praise God that we can have complete confidence in this book as we can with all of the scriptures. So who was Luke? We don't know a whole lot other than what we can pick up from Paul's letters and and just sort of the internal information from his own writings. Uh, If you want to turn to Colossians chapter 4, I'm going to point out things twice here. But if you go right to verse 14, Paul mentions, Luke, the beloved physician, greets you. Luke was a medical doctor. His description of diseases and medical conditions uh, that Jesus healed or... uh, Show the training of someone 
that was in the medical field. He's very careful. Now, you can just stay there, but Philemon in verse 24, Paul includes him among his list of his fellow workers, he said. So, he, was, he had become a medical missionary. We have a lot of medical missionaries these days. We send them out on the field. Um, and so that was, sort of seems like an apt way of describing Luke. We don't know exactly what his role was, but I don't think he was just sitting there interviewing and writing things down. Paul said he was a worker. He was with me. Uh, one more thing that Paul tells us at uh, 2 Timothy 4, one of Paul's last letters, Paul says, Luke alone is with me. Wow. The man who stayed with Paul to the end in his imprisonment in Rome. We don't know if he was there at Paul's death. He doesn't record how Paul died uh, in Acts, but he was loyal. Now, uh, if you still have Colossians 4 open, you can see kind of the longer list of people that Paul refers to in verses 10 through 17. And he kind of separates them into two lists. The first list is the circumcised ones. He's telling which ones were Jews. And then the other list is obviously Gentiles. So Luke was a Gentile. Right? As you remember, the Jews sort of had the inside track, but Paul and the other Writers are saying, no, the Gentiles are included too. That was the struggle in the early church. So Luke was somewhat of an outsider. That's significant, as we'll see. Um, We know that Luke was well-educated. He wrote in the most sophisticated language of any New Testament writer. He uses over 700 words that aren't found anywhere else in the New Testament. Uh, His writings are both theologically rich and historically reliable. So, let's go back to Luke. Uh, Let's look at the the end of verse 3 and verse 4. Who was this book written to and why? uh, Luke says, To write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. All right, Luke addresses this gospel to a certain person, Theophilus, uh, as he also mentions in Acts, both of them. Are written to him, right? So, so who is this person that Luke wrote this two-part long narrative to? Um, the fact that he used the phrase most excellent or most honorable in some translations uh, may mean that he was a Roman official. Uh, he's almost certainly a Gentile as well. I don't think we can be totally sure of who he was. Maybe he's a friend of Luke's. Um, Maybe somebody involved in Paul's trials. We don't know. But we also recognize that that Luke had worked really hard on these, done a ton of research, and I think he knew this was going to be circulated far and wide. He probably knew this was going to be part of the enduring accounts of Jesus. And so he meant them to go beyond just one person. Do you know what the name Theophilus means? Lover of God, which means that it's meant for you and me and anyone who wants to learn how to love God better. Luke wrote them for us. So why? What was the apparent reason that Luke wrote this for Theophilus, all Theophiluses? To give him certainty. Did you see that? We, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught right he so he he probably had the basics of jesus's life and teaching being a gentile he hopefully would have been told about the whole what was then the scriptures but what we call the old testament and so brought up to speed on who's yahweh what are the covenants what you know what's all the background to this and then who's jesus and luke just wanted to give him the certainty that these things really did happen, that Jesus' life was real and amazing. Yes, we have faith in Jesus, but it is not an empty faith, right? It is a faith 
that we have to believe, and there's a, there's a leap of logic they say, but it's not based on nothing, right? It is based on true, provable, verifiable facts of history. And so we read the Gospels today, hopefully multiple times, over and over, to remind us of our certainty. We live our lives going to work, to school, uh, eating every few hours, distracting ourselves with hobbies and entertainment and politics and all of these things. And sometimes the idea that God came in the flesh and lived a perfect life, that Jesus was here and taught the deep truths of God's ways and then dying for us does not seem real or particularly convincing. So we dive back into the historical accounts to be reminded, to be given that certainty again and again. Remember in the seventh Star Wars movie, The Force Awakens, a character named Rey has met the legendary Han Solo. She's in kind of in awe. And at one point she says, the Jedi were real? Right? She doesn't really know. And Han answers, I used to wonder about that myself. thought it was a bunch of mumbo-jumbo, a magical power holding it together, good and evil, the dark side and the light. Crazy thing is, it's true. The Force, the Jedi, all of it, it's all true. Now I realize I run the risk of equating Christian faith with the Force, with this illustration that's dangerous. Let me just say very clearly, the Gospel is not the Force. God is not the force. It's not what I mean. But I think we can do something similar to those who are wondering, is it really real? And we say, the countless fulfilled prophecies, the God of the universe taking on flesh and joining His creation as one of them, the virgin birth, the miracles, the healings, the profound teachings, the betrayal, the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension, the sacrificial death on the cross, taking my sins and giving me righteousness that gets me to heaven, all of it, it's all true. That's why we study this historical account of this unique, amazing life. Now, uh, if you're taking notes, the third point, distinctives of Luke's gospel. I know that I said that Luke is very similar to Matthew and Mark, but about 30% of Luke's gospel is totally unique to him, material that's not recorded in the other gospels. I think John's going to be an even higher percentage, but th- that's almost a third of what Luke writes. You can't find in the other gospels. Some of the most distinctive teachings and interactions of Jesus are only found there. The Good Samaritan, the prodigal son, Zacchaeus, the tax collector, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, the rich man. Can you imagine if we didn't have those stories? The prodigal son? Wow. Um, Reading about the Gospels again this week, I was reminded uh, there's some theologians and Bible scholars try to help us kind of keep them uh, separated. Uh, the, the Gospel writers, while they're so similar, they do emphasize different things. Um, Kent Hughes says this, he said that Matthew's keynote or main word or theme is royalty. Mark's is power. Luke's is love. He actually doesn't say what John's is. I don't, I, spirit, maybe. I should write him. I don't. Uh, but he says that love uniquely shines through in saying after saying, parable after parable in this gospel. Now, uh, another way to keep these gospels straight, uh, I don't know if you've uh, seen, I think there's a diagram of this. You could probably pull it up on the internet. But there's, there's a prophecy from the first chapter of Ezekiel that's repeated sort of in uh, Revelations chapter 4. It's a little different. But the idea is that there's four animals and they're 
either on the face of these creatures or four faces of each creature, depending on Ezekiel or Revelation. But the fact is there's, there's four uh, creatures. Uh, and so theolo- there's a man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle. And so theologians have assigned those to the different gospel writers. So Matthew is the man because he started his gospel with Jesus' genealogy and his humanity, the emphasis on his humanity. Mark is the lion because he begins with John the Baptist thundering in the wilderness and he's, his style is direct and to the point. Uh, we'll jump to John. John is the eagle um, because there aren't, there aren't par- there's many parables in the book of John. Uh, Jesus is really speaking plainly and openly, and it's like the eagle eye version, and the fact that the eagle is closer to heaven, and John wrestles with the deep spiritual truths of the logos of God, the secrets of heaven. So who is Luke? Luke is the ox. The Gospel of Luke begins with Zechariah, the priest. That's who we're going to next week and emphasizes that Jesus is the sacrifice for his people. Now, John Calvin and some of these other guys said, "Mm, that's a little far-fetched. So take all of that with a grain of salt. Um, If it helps you understand the Gospels, keep them straight, great. They they do really have different emphases. Um, Luke, I'm not going to talk about all of their emphases, but particularly Luke seems to care. Remember I said he's a Gentile. He's an outsider. And so there is a bit of a natural inclination to tell the stories of the outsiders. So we've got the shepherds, the widows, the poor, the Gentiles. Luke's gospel actually introduces the most women, not just the three Marys, but Elizabeth, Anna, Martha, Joanna, Susanna, and and lots of parables about women. Now, that's not to imply or say that the, gosp- the other gospel writers were sexist or elitist or anything like that, right? They, were, they had other things they were emphasizing. But Luke seems to uniquely emphasize those things. Michael Card points out that there are over 15 times in Luke's gospel where two people or groups of people are shown something. And each time, the person who should have understood because they are a teacher or a religious leader or an insider, those people didn't understand. The person who should not have understood because they're an outsider in some way actually get it right. And so you have for instance, the Pharisee and the tax collector, right? The, the Pharisee in, in Luke 18, the Pharisee should have known how to pray in a way that pleased God, but he just bragged on himself, right? Whereas the tax collector, just, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, should have been clueless about prayer, but God is pleased by his prayer. And so you have this over and over, Right, the prodigal son and his older brother. The difference there, the rich man and Lazarus. Right? Lazarus is a beggar, a nobody. But he's in heaven. The rich man is in hell. The priest and the Levite, who should have reacted right when they saw someone hurting, versus the despised Samaritan who gets called good. Simon the Pharisee and the sinful woman who anointed Jesus over and over, right? Luke draws attention to the contrast between people who were respected and should have said and done the right thing and the lowly, disreputable people who we don't expect to do anything, but they end up pleasing God and Jesus. So keep that framework in mind as we move through the gospel. Um. Luke's thesis statement, he doesn't say, this is my thesis statement, but a lot of writers have said, you know what, it's probably Luke 19.10. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Right, his whole life 
was a rescue mission accomplishing all the work that the Father set before Him to do. He accomplished it. He saved the people then, the people before the people that had come after, all the way to us who were lost and have now been found. And then He handed over the work of spreading the gospel and the good news to His followers, which also reaches down to us. So, if you have been waiting a long time for some hope in your life, if you are part of the forgotten and overlooked people, and if you wonder if you matter, or if your soul is troubled, and guilt overwhelms you at time, and you need answers and peace. Maybe you've been practicing religion, but don't quite know what the point is. If, if you fast or keep the Sabbath or memorize Scripture, but you've lost your passion for why you do those things. If you have trouble forgiving the people who sin against you. If you have friends or family members who you thought were walking with God but have now walked far away from Him. If you wonder if the Lord can use you and use your gifts and talents in a way that's significant. If you've driven past or walked past people who have obviously been beaten down in life and it maybe tugs at you, maybe I should do something more about this. If you don't know how to pray and you wonder why it's such a struggle and you wonder if God even hears your prayers. If you're intimidated by religious professionals and think that they have all the answers. If you're storing up a lot of wealth, but sometimes you wonder if your money owns you and not the other way around. If you've ripped people off and treated them terribly and wonder if there's a way to make it right. If you're a prodigal who has lost your way, and you wonder if God can even stand the sight of you. Or if you're the older brother of a prodigal and really can't stand how much grace he's been given. If you've betrayed God in your words and action, and if you wonder if he'll forgive you and restore you. If you are afraid of death and what comes after our time on earth. If you wonder if you'll actually be invited to the great wedding feast of the Lamb in heaven. If you wonder if you'll be with Jesus in paradise today, have I got the book for you? All of those things. We're going to hit them all. So, step into the world of the first century with me, into the words of Luke, as he turns his interviews and his research into the most compelling, accurate, honest portrayal of the God-man, the Christ. So, all you lovers of God, let's dive deep into this book together. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that we don't have to guess who you are, what you are like. We would have no idea if you had not revealed yourself to us. Yes, the world supplies a lot of answers. The world makes up religions that they think make sense and are helpful. 
but you have actually revealed yourself in the pages of the Scriptures. Thank you that we can trust them. That the Spirit guided their creation. That while it seems there are inconsistencies and problems and biases and all of those things, when we look closer, archaeology hasn't proved it wrong. Historical records and data haven't proved it wrong. And so we embrace the Scriptures and what they teach us. Thank you for Luke and that you tapped him to be one of the four Gospel writers. Thank you for his training in many fields, his education, and his willingness to do some hard work, some hard research, and then put that together so that we could have another beautiful picture of Jesus' life. May we not take that for granted. May reading the Scriptures never be a chore that we resent, because they are a gift. So help us and guide us as we dive in to this amazing book, as it speaks to us in Advent time, but beyond that as we work our way through the life of the greatest person, the God-man, Jesus Christ. Thank you for that gift. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing the doxology to close. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Let earth and heavenly saints proclaim the power and might of His great name. Let us exalt on bended knee. Praise God the Holy Trinity. Receive the benediction from the end of Romans. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith To the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.